For Crema Media's policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is clinical infectious diseases epidemiologist and director at Caprisa, Professor Salim Abdul Karim, to discuss health related issues and COVID 19. So, Professor, do you think that we are over the worst uh, with the COVID 19 pandemic, or are there still major risks? I think there's a very fundamental issue, and that is that we are still living in the midst of a pandemic. There's nothing over about this pandemic. People are still getting infected, still being hospitalized, and they're still dying. But it's not at the same level as what we were dealing with at the beginning of the pandemic. With vaccines, we have now been able to control the spread of this virus through much of the world. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to achieve high enough vaccination coverage in many parts of Africa. So that's still a task that remains to be done. So the job is not finished. We still have a way to go. The concern is that there is no scenario in the world where we can control this virus if some countries have good high vaccination coverage and good control of the virus. And in other parts of the world, the virus is spreading rampantly because every time the virus spreads, we are running the risk of more mutations. So ultimately, we can only control this virus when the whole world is able to control this virus. What is now your assessment, Professor, on how our government and other governments around the world have handled the virus? Part of the challenge with COVID-19 is the very high level of uncertainty. So if I had to tell you, when can we expect a new variant? What is that variant going to look like? Are we going to see lots of people going back into hospitals with COVID-19? The answers to those are not known. There's a high level of uncertainty. So that means that governments and individuals like you and I, we have to make decisions in the midst of high levels of uncertainty. It's that uncertainty that makes it difficult to determine whether everybody is, or any one person or any one government is doing the right thing all the time. We can just go with what is the most likely scenario that's going to work. Overall, there have been countries that have done quite well, and there have been countries that haven't done so well. They've done quite badly. Examples of those are countries like the US, the UK, and Brazil are three countries that have done pretty badly in this pandemic. Large numbers of infections, lots of deaths, uncontrolled epidemics, actually. And then we've had some countries that have done reasonably well. South Africa features in them. There are countries that have done even better than we have. Countries like New Zealand, Vietnam come to mind. So overall, there's been a, a spectrum across which some have done really badly, some have done really well, and some have done okay. And Professor, now besides the long COVID-19 causing long-term effects of respiratory issues, as we all know, there's been this emerging research that you've shared in other platforms that talks about brain issues, even strokes or heart attacks. Can you briefly share with our viewers? So because this is a pandemic, that has only existed for just over two years, we don't really know what the long-term consequences of this virus are. Now, in the last six to eight months, several studies have now been able to assess one year after getting COVID, what are the effects of COVID-19. So on the one hand is the condition that we refer to as long COVID. Long COVID 
occurs in between 10 and 20% of people. So between one out of 10, one out of 20 people, regardless of whether you had COVID in a very severe form or in a mild form or an asymptomatic form, you are at risk of long COVID. What is long COVID? It's a whole range of symptoms coming together, but probably simplest described as my patients tell me, it's like a brain fog. They can't concentrate They get tired quickly. They get muscle pain. They get all kinds of illnesses. That's long COVID. But now research is also coming out that suggests that even if you don't have long COVID, there are many other effects of this virus. Among them are effects on the heart system, on what is called the cardiovascular system. There there is a 50% increase in the risk of heart disease. And that's stroke, myocarditis, and heart attacks. And that is regardless of whether you have any risk factors. We know that if you smoke or if you're overweight or you don't exercise, you have a high cholesterol, you're going to have a heart attack. That's a more, it's a higher risk of getting heart disease. Even if you don't have those risk factors, if you've just had COVID-19, you are at an increased risk of getting these heart diseases. Now we know also that if you've had COVID-19, you're at a higher risk of getting diabetes because the virus itself attacks the cells in the pancreas that make insulin. And because of that, you lose the ability to control sugar and you get diabetes. Thirdly, we're now seeing studies that show that people who get COVID-19, their brains are getting smaller. They are losing part of their gray matter, the, the part of their brain that they use to think. Now, that's a concern that we have all these long-term effects And they occur regardless of whether you've had mild COVID or severe COVID. And we've had billions of people getting infected. So we can expect over the years that we may see these long-term sequelae of COVID-19 in our healthcare system. And now, Professor, another concern is the issue of uh, our teenagers, this that shows that uh, we still have a lot of them uh, who have not been vaccinated. In fact, today I read a podcast where now we see that government is using the schools in the Western Cape as vaccination sites so that uh, more teenagers can vaccinate. Is this a concern? It's a very deep concern. How, how can we expect that we can send our children to go to school safely? How can we expect them to go to university safely if they're not vaccinated? A person who is vaccinated has a much lower risk of getting infected. And even if they do get infected, they have a much lower risk of spreading the virus to others. That means that we would like to be in an indoor setting with people who are vaccinated. That way we reduce our risk. Remember. In COVID-19, I am only safe when you are safe. You are only safe when I am safe. We depend on each other. So because we depend on each other and because our risk is influenced by everybody else's risk, it makes sense that people should be vaccinated. That means that when we're talking about going into indoor settings like classrooms, lecture rooms, meeting rooms, pubs, restaurants, all of those environments should really have vaccinated people. So my encouragement is to say that we should ask and encourage everybody to get vaccinated, regardless of age. But in indoor settings, if you want to come indoors and share that space with other people, you must be vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, then you are choosing not to join others in those kinds of activities. And that's what I believe is very fundamental. If we don't do that, 
we are going to run a huge risk that when a new variant comes about, it will spread very rapidly because we've created the conditions for it to spread. So get vaccinated if you want to do activities with others. And recently, a professor such data has reported that many South Africans have been looking up at monkeypox more than now COVID-19. Can you briefly explain it for now? Because we know there are no cases in our country for now of monkeypox. Can you briefly tell us what we need to know about a monkeypox? Monkeypox is a very different virus from SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, very different. Monkeypox is a double-stranded DNA virus, whereas COVID-19 is a single-stranded RNA virus. So these are very different viruses. Monkeypox first infected humans that we were aware of in 1970. So it's about 50-odd years old. Since 1970, we've had a few outbreaks of monkeypox. They've been small outbreaks. Usually, you know, 30, 40, 50 patients get the disease and then it's contained. The reason it's easy to contain monkeypox is that monkeypox does not spread until a person has symptoms. So that means that Unlike SARS-CoV-2, where people are walking around asymptomatic and they're spreading the virus, with monkeypox, you can't do that. In monkeypox, the virus spreads when you develop the rash. The rash looks like a chickenpox rash. They're little scabs, and the virus is in those scabs. So for one person to spread the virus to another person, they have to be in close contact then the uninfected person has to really get the virus from those skin lesions, from that rash. So that's why monkeypox doesn't spread very fast. It doesn't cause huge outbreaks. In this particular instance, we are now seeing monkeypox in many countries. That's what's worrying. It's different from what we've seen in the past. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to be spreading rapidly. It just seems to be spreading in small groups, in groups that stay close to one another. But other than that, it doesn't seem to be causing a kind of epidemic situation that we are seeing with SARS-CoV-2. So for all those reasons, we're not overly concerned about chickenpox. And remember that the smallpox vaccine is effective against monkeypox. So for those people who were born before 1970, they've been vaccinated against smallpox. So they won't get monkeypox easily. The smallpox vaccine works quite well against monkeypox. And now there is a new monkeypox vaccine that's available. And in many countries, they're now making it available and using their old stocks of smallpox vaccine to vaccinate communities that are at risk. So we should, if all goes well, be able to control the monkeypox epidemic in a way that should not pose any major problems to the whole world. You were also at the forefront when the country was fighting HIV and AIDS. How would you compare South Africa's response to COVID-19 to our response to HIV and AIDS? Well, I think uh, South Africa's response to HIV was disastrous initially. Instead of appreciating and dealing with the pandemic of HIV, our government at the time under President Mbeki chose to go into denial. Our approach was to take the ostrich approach. Let's hide our heads in the sand and hope it doesn't exist or it goes away. Well, it turns out that that really was a very harmful policy process in our country. Many people died unnecessarily because of one person's fixation that antiretrovirals shouldn't be given to the public because HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Just nonsense. It comes from people who don't understand the basic elements of science, the basic elements of how viruses cause syndromes. Mm -hmm. Now in SARS-CoV-2, we had the opposite. 
We had leadership that understood the threat, dealt with the threat, and dealt with it very decisively. Now, that's the kind of leadership we need to be able to deal with a pandemic. Two very different approaches. Talking about leadership, we are talking to you, and uh, we know that the WHO re-elected Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus to serve a second term. What do you think should be the priorities now for WHO, especially for the African continent? I'm very fortunate to be among Dr. Tedros's science advisors. We are a nine-member science council that he established to give him scientific advice. Our job is to anticipate what the future needs may be so that the WHO is better prepared to impact and improve health. Right now, the WHO is being pulled in many different directions, but its priority in terms of dealing with pandemics remains very high. And the focus has been on pandemic preparedness. How do we ensure that we are better prepared for the next variant of SARS-CoV-2 and for the next pandemic that when it comes along. Whether it's another coronavirus and we call it SARS-CoV-3 or whether we deal with a completely different kind of virus like influenza, which we've always concerned that we may see an influenza pandemic. So all of these viral threats are ever present. We cannot afford to take our foot off the pedal. We have to maintain our emphasis. We've got to maintain our effort in ensuring we are well prepared for the next pandemic. So now, Professor, what would you say to those people who are now COVID tired, who are no longer like washing their hands and worried about wearing masks and using sanitizers as before? I feel sympathy for you. I'm tired of this virus. I'm fed up of this virus, actually. I just wish it would go away. But wishing that it would go away doesn't make it go away. It is still very much with us. We cannot afford to become complacent. If we do, we give the virus another chance. We don't want to do that. We have to take the precautions each of us, to ensure that we don't get infected. Why don't we want to get infected? Not because I'm worried that, you know, we may get uh, severely ill. I'm worried about the bigger problems like long COVID, like the fact that it makes your brain smaller. No one should willingly want to get infected. We should all take the precautions that we need to do in order to protect ourselves. If each of us acts in that way, then we have a chance. And that chance is about trying to get us back on a good footing where we can ease our restrictions and go back to a a much stronger sense of normality. But we can't do that if we don't stand together. We can't do that if we're not all working to control the spread of this virus. This, is, this virus has always been, as Dr. Ted Dawson says, that no one is safe until everyone is safe. So that's what we've got to do. Stand together and every one of us needs to be safe. And lastly, Professor, now on a personal level, you have worked tirelessly and publicly helping our country shape its response to this pandemic. What are the main lessons you draw from this process? I could uh, write a whole book about all the things that we have learned in the course of this pandemic, but I'll just draw on three things. The first is that we have to ensure that we have the healthcare service preparation that can deal with a pandemic. That means laboratories that can do the testing, uh, hospital beds to care for the sick and the ill. I mean, all of the healthcare infrastructure has to be in place. Unfortunately, in South Africa, a lot of it has not been in place because the healthcare service has been deteriorating over time. 
But the healthcare service and its preparedness is fundamental. The second is that when you're dealing with a pandemic like this, you have to expect that there will be some crackpots that want to take a different view. And those are people who will want to take a different view. They don't want to get a vaccine, but which is known to work, but they want to take ivermectin, a drug that doesn't work. So, and it's not only the lay public. There are medical doctors, uh, there are engineers, there are lawyers who are all promoting this kind of conspiracy theories. Don't take a vaccine. Why? Bill Gates put a microchip in that vaccine so he can monitor where you're walking and what you're doing. What nonsense is that? Bill Gates has got many more important things to do than to worry about where you're walking. The third, for me, is that I've come to understand that if we are to win against uh, a virus like this, we have to know what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And we have to use the best science that's available. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't follow the evidence, if we don't, even in the midst of uncertainty, if we don't have somebody who understands or some people who understand the underlying science mm -hmm. and that can provide guidance, then we might take the wrong actions. And those wrong actions could have disastrous consequences. So I think for me, it has highlighted the importance of science. It has highlighted the value that we place on science. And it has highlighted for me how science, the public, the community, the politicians, the professionals, the business people, we can all come together and deal with this pandemic. There was Director Edgar Prisa, Professor Salim Abdul Karim, in conversation with Polity about health-related issues and COVID-19.